Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to this session. Thank you to everybody who has joined us today. I really regret that we have to have this conversation under the restrictions imposed by the COVID-19 pandemic. But fortunately, technology developed by so many scientists is allowing us to be virtually together. My name is Claude Primes, and I am the program manager for Grand Challenge Brazil. I am delighted to be the moderator of this outbreak session together with Carly Silver, who is the co-CEO of the Grand Challenge Canada. And we will explore how the Grand Challenge model can promote to reducing systemic gender discrimination and inequalities in health. Despite the recent efforts to promote gender equity, women still represent less than one third of the world's researchers. They are underrepresented at the higher academic ranks, accounting for less than a quarter of leadership positions. We had, however, a shed of light at the beginning of this month. Andrea Guest, selected as one of the Nobel laureates in physics, and Emmanuel Charpentier, together with Jennifer Dauda, shared the Nobel Prize in chemistry. <clears throat> the current pandemic, however, is making women's productivity, even in science, lower <clears throat> as compared to the pre-pandemic period. In contrast, they make up 70% of the health workforce, but still have to face a double or even triple burden due to the structures imposed by society. Grand Challenges is a family of initiatives fostering innovation to solve global health and development problems. The GCNL meeting occurs every year since 2003, putting together scientists, innovators, health professionals from universities, companies, NGOs, and governments from everywhere in the world. This year, the GC meeting is joining the women's, Women Leaders in Global Health Conference, which represents an opportunity to share the GC initiatives aiming at the removal of barriers that prevent women and girls from having the same opportunities as men, especially in the R&D field. We will start this session on how grant challenges can open grant opportunities from the perspective of a grantee, We'll then discuss the, uh, with three GC leaders how the Grand Challenge enables women to participate in science and innovation. And finally, discuss leadership on, of health research seen from the eyes of the first woman leading the most important health research institute in Brazil. Before we introduce our speakers, let me remind you that we'll have the opportunity to discuss with the audience at the end of the session. So please use the chat function and type your questions. The session will be recorded and will be available on the Women Lift, uh, Women Lift Help website and social media channels. Without further delay, I'd like to welcome our speakers Thank you for being here to share our, uh, your experiences and expertise. So let's start with Claire Vanham. She is an assistant professor of global health policy at the London School of Economics and Political Science. She and two other scientists, one from Brazil, the other from Tanzania, received a grant under the last GC meeting, Call to Action. So Claire, could you please share with us the idea of your project and how the gender approach is connected to global health research? Thank you to be here. Thank you so much, Claude, and thank you to Grand Challenges and to Women Leaders in Global Health for having me here. As uh, Claude said, I'm a grantee under the Grand Challenges Award from last year's um, successful event in Addis Ababa. And the, the conversation we had about why we thought this was a, a good area to tackle was really coming back to that fundamental central uh, uh, mandate of the Grand Challenges Initiative, which is to solve problems that affect the most vulnerable. Um, we have been, uh, my colleagues in, in Brazil at Fia Cruz and at FGV, and also with colleagues in, uh, in Tanzania at the International Center for Insect Physiology and Ecology, We've been talking a lot about Zika and my previous research had all been around how do governments respond to epidemics and pandemics and how do they prepare for and respond to outbreaks. And through our work in Zika, it became really apparent that women weren't part of the conversation. And that really surprised us because 
women were visibly the most affected by the Zika outbreak. We saw, obviously, everyone can remember the pictures that were all over the front pages of um, newspapers of mothers cradling babies born with microcephaly. And we were wondering, well, if they're so visible, they must be being considered by policymakers. And with our policy analysis hats on, we did some some policy land, landscaping uh, and mapping of what policies were going on in Brazil and in other countries of Latin America to respond to it. And these policies really hadn't been gender mainstream. So they hadn't been considering women. They'd been considering if infections as if men or women were affected in the same way. And that led us thinking to one more, sort of one further step of analysis on from that, which is as a difference between a woman being infected with an outbreak or with a particular virus or pathogen and being affected. And these are very different notions of, of what's important when we think about outbreak policy. So we don't, we need to move away from simply just counting cases and counting the epidemiological or clinical manifestations of the disease. But we really need social scientists like, like ourselves to think about, well, what are, the, what are the ripple effects of this? Now, obviously, in conversations around Zika and women, the ripple effects were huge, right? We saw conversations around who's able to access reproductive health, for example, or, or if, if governments are asking women to delay pregnancy, postpone pregnancy, if women themselves, even without uh, being in a country where governments had asked people to postpone pregnancy, uh, felt scared, didn't feel like it was the right time to have a baby, were they able to do that? That's a very, you know, a manifest way we see these affects of outbreaks on women. But we also were able to detail through qualitative research a lot of the unpaid care that women perform in implementing policy to respond to outbreaks such as Zika. So we can see that in the Zika outbreak, such as, you know, who's looking after the children that are born with these lifelong conditions? And it tends to be almost, uh, almost universally women, right? We've seen a lot of men abandon their partners. But what we also saw was a lot of unpaid labor and domestic labor going on in the vector control to try and minimize the spread of the disease. So when government policy said you had to avoid being bitten, this came within a broader mandate around uh, integrated vector control. So it wasn't just about government efforts, whether at federal or state or municipal level to uh, fumigate and try and destroy vector breeding grounds, but it was also asking citizens in their houses not to store water or to frequently upturn water and to make sure that in civic spaces you weren't leaving big puddles, right? And so this was creating additional labor, right, for people to do all of this beyond their day job. And we recognize that a lot of this labor was falling to women. Gender norms would presuppose that, but actually our data also demonstrated that it was women doing this labor. And so this was the starting point of our conversation for our Grand Challenges grant, which is how do we recognize all the work that women do in vector control, right? How can we try and recognize this and make sure that policymakers recognize that when they are implementing vector control activities, they really need not just community buy-in for the acceptance of the intervention, but you need women to buy into it to actually agree to do a lot of the labor because a lot of it assumes free labor. So we wanted to turn it on its head. And so the question we pose, and we've just, we, you know, we're in the initial months of our, of our grant at the moment, but the question we're posing is what happens if you turn it on its head? What happens if you mainstream these policies and you put women at the center of them? And when you recognize all the work that women are doing, both in, 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 in vector control, but also how, they, they, you know, we, we're just looking at arboviruses in our research, but how do arboviruses affect women differently as well? And the downstream effects of, of whether it's a Zika intervention, a Zika uh, infection or a dengue infection, how can we try and understand from the women who are performing this labor about how, how it affects their lives? And then how can we feed that upstream to ensure that the policies are then appropriate and I recognize this? Now, I don't just mean recognizing it financially. I, I recognize that that's obviously a big ask for a lot of countries to suggest they should be paying women on the front, on, you know, in the community to do this. But 
how can we think of other ways of incentivizing women and or men or other genders to contribute to this uh, vector control effort? And so this was supposed to be the, the, our research is hoping to give some answers around how we can create a more sustainable vector control policy by putting women at the center and recognizing that it's not just about, you know, I probably shouldn't say that at an event like this, it's not just about women who work in science uh, contributing to health issues, but it's about women at every level of society and women on, you know, living in every community of the world who are in effect contributing to global health. And so how can we recognize that and make sure that it's, it's in within our policies as we go forward? And what we hope to do is to be able to design a, a gender mainstream policy, which we can then share with governments at, again, different levels at, at, at the local level, in the municipal level, state level, federal level, global level, to show what would happen if we just turned the whole thing on its head. And this isn't about radical, you know, innovative technology and science. It's just repositioning who's important and what principles around equity and gender mainstreaming and gender diversity that we bring into the policy making that we are creating. I look forward to talking more about this today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Claire, for your this beautiful project and amazing ideas. Um, so let's um, uh, switch to the other speakers. In, it, it is a real privilege to have three GC leaders with us today, giving different views about the gender dimension involved in this pandemic and on how the GC family is contributing to improving gender equality. So let's start with Moses. Lobo, he, who is um, the program manager for Grand Challenges Africa at the African Academy of Sciences. So Moses, my question for you is how GC Africa can contribute to addressing gender inequalities? And can you give us some examples? Absolutely, thank you, Claudie, and uh, thank you all uh, for, for having listened you know, to to me, I was, I, was, I was very excited when I discovered that uh, I'm a male ally in this particular conference. So um, I'm going to share to, with you a little bit about what we do in uh, uh, Grand Challenges Africa. Um, and uh, I'll start with the, sort of like an embarrassing note because at the moment of the 84 different uh, grantees that are there within uh, our portfolio in Grand Challenges Africa, 25% of them only are women. So the question is, uh, uh, what is this that we are doing uh, to actually promote women innovators to do more? Um, so one of the interesting things about the Grand Challenges model is that we do not go for you know, arbitrary age limits and arbitrary academic limits. Uh, so for example, saying that uh, you must have a PhD at 25 years old or 30 years old, which definitely will discriminate against women. But what we say is you should be suitably qualified to deliver your work. And uh, I can tell you there's no shortage of uh, uh, role models once you just put that very simple criteria uh, for you know, um, implementation of uh, innovations. So for example, um, we've got uh, Iruka Okeke, a drug discovery uh, scientist working out of uh, University of Ibadan, uh, who's done quite well um, with her work on uh, uh, diarrhea and uh, e. e. coli. And then, of course, um, we've also got another cutting-edge scientist, uh, Oslem Bishop, uh, who uses modern uh, computational uh, biology for drug discovery. Uh, so, I mean, if you, if you, if you think about it, um, um, Sometimes even just some practical aspects or practical problems or questions can actually be answered better by women innovators rather than male innovators. And I'll give you an example. So um, um, we've got uh, one of our innovators, Christine Musimi, who's looking at uh, uh, maternal depression in uh, one of the counties uh, here in uh, Kenya. And uh, if you think about it, um, maternal depression being the problem 
uh, can be a little bit challenging for uh, you to understand uh, if you've never, you know, uh, sort of either experienced it or connected with someone who's experienced it. Um, it, it, it can be quite a challenge. Um, and uh, I always say that we are glad to have Christine um, see me doing that piece of work that she is doing. And then, of course, there is the issue of trust in science. Um, there are some types of innovations that uh, if you were to try and do, for example, as a man, um, it can be quite um, uh, uh, challenging. So one of our innovators, for example, Galgalo Adi, uh, is uh, using coin-sized solar-powered uh, GPS tracking and alert devices, putting them on uh, high-risk pregnant women in an arid area that is, uh, you know, has quite a bit of tribal wars and fights for uh, resources like water. Now, if you're from that community, and of course you're a man, and then you attempt to actually do such kind of a research uh, that uh, uh, starts to map out areas of uh, highest likelihood of placing, for example, health centers or dispensaries that can be able to reduce the maternal and uh, neonatal mortality that is usually seen in these kind of areas, you will definitely get uh, some, some form of a pushback. So that particular trust um, uh, is, a, is, a, is a chance that uh, uh, we do not take for uh, granted. So I just wanted to say that uh, uh, by enabling women to actually participate in innovations, we utilize the potential of the entire population, uh, something that uh, we think that uh, at 25%, we are still doing poorly and we can uh, uh, definitely do more. So just something uh, uh, small on the work environment. Um, within the Grand Challenges uh, Africa program initiative, we provide negotiability uh, of the work schedule uh, and also um, we try and uh, organize our networking activities and uh, networking opportunities so that they can actually be able to favor women leaders. Uh, so for example, um, uh, we do not conduct our networking activities at uh, 3 a.m. or uh, in certain parts of the world that uh, um, require travel away from family or, uh, you know, uh, 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 things like that. And then, of course, there's that possibility of, uh, for example, if you get pregnant and you've got a time limit uh, for your grant, um, we can always, if you notify us, we can always um, uh, negotiate and then see how best we can provide for you, you know, some, some form of uh, no-cost extension uh, and allow you to actually uh, finish your work. So I'll stop there for now, Cloudy, and uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you so much, Moses. These are at the same time, I mean, knowing that 20, only 25% of the women are really grantees on the Africa um, GC. Uh, this is all over the globe. We have the same problem, but it, I mean, you, you have been working in very good initiatives. Thank you so much. So I'll switch to Carly who has been the, at, with GC Canada from the very beginning at 2010. And she is now the co-CEO of GCC, a program committed to supporting gender equality. So Carly, we would like to hear from you how GCC is applying a gender lens in its activities. And if you can give us some example, examples in this particular moment of COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you very much, Claude, and it's a real pleasure to be here today and um, glad to hear of the broad um, audience that we are engaging at the moment. Um, so in terms of how Grand Challenges Canada applies a gender lens um, to all of our elements of our work, it really starts with who um, leads us. Uh, women occupy powers of position, or positions of power, sorry, at Grand Challenges Canada, our chair of our board, our chair of our audit and finance committee, of our program advisory council, and our indigenous advisory council are all, um, are all women. 
Um, and this allowed us the opportunity for myself and my co-CEO um, to be accepted and appointed as uh, co-CEOs um, on our request several years ago. And I think even that foundation of who's making decisions and such is very important. Um, in these day and ages of uh, living at home, I'm just going to let my dog out one moment. Apologies for that. <laughs> Balancing life and work here. Okay. Um, uh, the other thing I would say is that um, right now we are fortunate being in Canada that um, we have the Canada's Feminist International Assistance Policy that really gives us cover to focus on barriers around gender equality. And we are absolutely taking advantage of this. Um, this goes to really uh, when we're talking about what types of things we want to fund. Um, some of the challenges we prioritize are very um, squarely on things that result in, um, in improved gender quality, such as access to sexual reproductive health and rights, including a specific program that um, focuses on the access to safe abortion. And so this is the kind of way that we're pushing the bounds and being able to use the policy window and the leadership we currently have in order to move, um, move forward on gender equality. The first focus of our Indigenous Innovation Initiative, which is our newest um, area of work, is focused on improving gender equality and privileges and centers um, First Nations, Inuit and Métis ways of knowing and being to amplify the voices and stories of Indigenous women and two-spirit, two lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, transsexual, queer, questioning, intersex, asexual and non gender conforming sexual identities. And these play, uh, these, these identities play a critical knowledge keeping role within many indigenous communities and um, are also core in actually revitalizing indigenous economies and path to scale. So we're actually really using this concept of, um, of different genders um, to really bring to the fore um, some knowledge that uh, because of colonial ac actions and such have been um, really buried um, to the detriment of all of society, we believe. And so our, our challenge right now on that is to surface um, that knowledge and uh, those leaders in order to make sure that we're going forward. And then even when a grand challenge that's been prioritized doesn't explicitly focus on gender equality um, and on, on meeting gender equality barriers, we integrate a gender lens um, throughout our investment process. And so what this really looks at is considering potential funded innovations through a variety of different um, gender frames or lenses. So for example, is the novel um, product and service inclusively designed with women and girls and other marginalized group in mind um, as customers or users and throughout the value chain? Are women well represented in the leadership and governance positions that surround that innovation? And does the organization have gender inclusive policies like the ones that Moses was referring to around maternity policies? What is the social policy context um, that, that this innovation would operate in? Are the norms and the broader contextual challenges and barriers to gender equality being considered and being pushed a little bit with this innovation? And so what we really look to do with our approach is to meet innovators where they are at in terms of their own developmental stage and funding and leadership capacity and context. Um, we expect innovators to be open to engaging on gender, but by no means do we expect them to be experts in this way of thinking to start. Um, and we provide them with expertise and exposure to those who are well, um, well trained in, in thinking through this way um, and actually let them uh, take the parts of it that really resonate to their work and resonate to, their, um, to what makes sense. And we're looking for achievable expectations. Our goal is not to leapfrog to a level of commitment of gender equality that's impractical for a very early stage startup um, that is focused on a specific thing, but it's really looking at how do you meet someone where they're at and build them up as a champion for gender equality, no matter where their sphere of influence is in the world. Um, I'm going to just talk very briefly about the fact that it comes straight from the point of, uh, of entry and, and application and, and put out a challenge that maybe the folks who are listening can help us with at the moment. 
We find that the processes we use within Grand Challenges Canada are not biased to any um, gender. So if we get a lot of applications in from women for a competition, they do well in the competition as well as men. Um, and, uh, and so what we're looking to do is to boost the number of applications we get in. That's kind of our biggest way to influence whether or not at the other end of the spectrum we get um, to fund uh, women innovators. Um, currently, one of our, this varies also by challenge in terms of whether or not we're successful on this. Um, Moses put out the 25%. Um, we have some programs where we are closer to um, 70% um, being women led. But as I said, it's very, very um, specific to the challenge that is being put out there. Right now, we have a challenge um, that was just launched, uh, our Creating Hope in Conflict, which is a humanitarian grand challenge that we do with um, USAID, with UK aid, and with the Dutch government. Um, and we're very interested in having more women participate in this, in this um, challenge. To date, we are still sitting at about 25% in terms of applications. Um, and as I said, in other programs, we've managed to get up over half. Um, and so we're really keen to be building that up. That challenge, um, we are still accepting applications for another five um, weeks. Um, and we're particularly interested in um, hearing from women who, are, uh, who have life experience living in conflict. Um, so in the Middle East, in other conflict zones um, of the world at the moment, and how they are thinking about tackling health, water and sanitation, energy and information um, that can save lives of people living in conflict. So if you have any ideas and if you have any um, amazing women uh, in your circles that would be um, good to apply for this, please encourage them to do so. Um, finally, I'm just going to say that, um, give one example of, um, of an innovation that we've supported to kind of show how we support an innovator to go through this process. This innovation is um, the Mamas Against Malaria at Scale. It's by Development Data Zambia, so based in Zambia. And their innovation is to really increase the access to pre-referral rectal artesanate, um, a life-saving drug administered immediately upon diagnosis of malaria in children to prevent the progression of severe malaria in children during tr transfer to tertiary care centers incredibly important when there's long distances to be covered um, in order to get to a place where severe malaria can be treated well. Um, the, the, um, uh, once we started working with um, mamas on, on this work um, with this project, um, what they really looked at was to, um, to figure out their gender quality approach, um, which was already strong upon entry into our portfolio. Um, but upon doing another uh, look at their strategy, what they figured out was um, they identified factors that affect women's ability to respond to the child health emergencies in a timely manner and started to look um, at supporting uh, innovators to develop gender smart pr principles to guide um, this way of thinking going forward. So one of the biggest barriers they saw was actually gender based violence. Um, and by with a large um, increase in gender based violence in a home, you actually saw a, a delay in terms of getting to care. Um, and so now the um, what was started as a malaria intervention now has incorporated elements of um, addressing and tackling gender based violence within the home in order to achieve the goals of saving and improving the lives of um, young children who develop malaria. So that's an example of where these often it's types of questions that we are having our innovators reflect on um, that open up new avenues to, uh, to actually doing our jobs better and making sure that we're achieving the types of goals that have been laid out in the sustainable development goals um, much more efficiently. I'm gonna leave it there um, and pass it back to Claude. Hey, thank you, Carly. This is our very, these are very good examples. And we know that it, it, it's a way, uh, how can we change, change this, um, these norms and these stereotypes. So thank you very much for this, um, for this, your um, ideas. Um, and our next panelist is Kadestis Fagiogis. 
it is a real privilege to have our Deputy Director for Global Partnerships and Grand Challenges, Discovery and Transnational Sciences at the Mill Melinda Gates Foundation. That's quite a title. Uh, CADES has been tirelessly working <clears throat> on building collaborative networks and long-term partnerships and is responsible for the GC annual meeting. CADES, thank you so much to, to be here. And we would love to hear from you about the role of the GC platform as a tool for partnerships and how this model can help to engage and empower women scientists. Thank you, Claude. Thanks, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so so you, you will start, for those of you who are not familiar with the Grand Challenges program, um, you're going to start hearing the same theme, right? So there is this sort of, what, what do we do? It's, it's really engaging the world IQ to tap into creative thinkers to solve some of these big problems that are affecting society and big problems like, for instance, infectious diseases that are affecting women and their families. Um, as, as you go out and you start developing these applications and you solicit um, requests for proposals, both Carly and, and Moses gave really good examples of, you know, you look at your portfolio and you're not doing well, right? Because your portfolio is not balanced. Um, for us, it was in every single way. It was um, geog by geography, we weren't doing well. There was just a, a really good section of the world that was well represented, but then um, we weren't doing well in, in the majority of countries. We weren't doing well in terms of perspectives and, and trainings, and obviously, definitely, we weren't doing well in, in gender. So you start looking at your own models and your own way of doing business, and as 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 you try um, to change the dynamic. So uh, we've designed a program about ten years ago called the Grand Challenges Exploration, where we we decided to lower the barrier of entry, which means. You know, you don't need a 10 or 15 page application. All you need is a two page application. Make it a little easier for people to participate. Um, my, one of the, my favorite one is conducting blind reviews. And this address, this went to the core of our problem. And, and one of Moses' uh, main point that he mentioned was when you start saying, you know, I'm not looking at your resume, I'm looking at your creative thinking and your innovative ways of solving this problem that the world is struggling with and your ability to execute, right? So then you take out this issue of a virtuous cycle where if you don't have a, lo a long resume, you don't get investments and grants and you cannot build your resume if you do not get grants and get that first chance. So it's, it's sort of a virtuous cycle and often uh, women are are affected by it. Young women are affected by it. So we, we you know, we we really try uh, to challenge ourselves as um, on an ongoing basis to look on not just the what we do, but how do we do our jobs and are we supporting? Are we really being enablers of these um, programs? So. When, when the innovators are working, are we taking off a lot of the barriers that, they, that they're dealing with? So, you know, the good news is it works, right? We started looking at a growing footprint of our, our grants are going to different institutions. Uh, slowly, we're making um, headway into our gender uh, lens where we're absolutely not there yet. We're about a third of our portfolio are led by female and, and, and women leaders, then now we're starting to say, okay, let's continue to make the improvement, but we're also looking at how do we support um, and how do we bridge the gap in science and science leadership, including the gender gaps, which we're talking about. Um, you may have seen a piece that Melinda Gates wrote um, a few months ago around gender inequality vis-a-vis -vis the current epidemic. And one of the things that, that, that she says, well, obviously it's affecting women and girls uh, um, in, in large numbers, but she also made a really nice case to say, well, women are not just victims of a broken world. 
they can also be architects of, of a better one. And, and that really resonates with me. So us as, as uh, supporters of, of innovators and investigators around the world working on the science, um, we're really looking at encouraging women-led organization and projects led by women, uh, requiring ourselves and of our partners to have matrix of success that includes new ways of, of measuring gender equality and empowerment of girls and women in the work they, they do. Um, continuing to design programs that allows new people and, and yes, women um, and, and new ideas just in general to come just yesterday in one of our uh, meetings, we announced the start of a fellowship programs uh, for now, we're focusing it on Africa and India, but it's really targeting emerging scientific leaders um, to become uh, really innovation champions in their communities. And they're already there. They just need a little bit of their support. And we've committed that 50% of that portfolio is going to be um, in women. And I will do everything in my power to make sure that, that, that we, we get there and we surpass that 50% margin. So, so the world has, has um, the Sustainable Development Goals. So, so SDG 5 is to achieve gender equality and empowerment of women and girls. But having equity is not, a is not just a goal in itself, right? Women as agenda setters is, because we know in each of our families, I'll tell you in mine, um, that, that my mom was, was a pillar of our family. But when, when we make women agenda setters, they don't just benefit themselves, they benefit their families, they benefit their communities and everybody wins. So supporting key institutions with strong women leaders to do the work now is, is probably one of the best strategy to scale gender equality in every sense. So we have a long way as a community, uh, we're learning, uh, we're supporting each other. Uh, we've got some fantastic women here on this panel. We've got incredible men allies such as Moses who himself has a staff of fabulous women. So, so it's not just the, the, the grants and the investments we're making, it's also looking within our teams, within the organizations that, that we're leading um, on how we're providing uh, opportunities for women to, to really reach their full potential. So um, I, I will stop there, but I am incredibly inspired by a lot of the conversation we're hearing. Uh, so encouraging and supporting and enabling more brilliant women, which they are everywhere. They just need a little bit of support to get out of where they are. To join our mission is how we guarantee that women um, are, as Melinda has said, architects of, the, of, the, of a better world uh, we seek, um, uh, that, that we seek. So I'll stop there and, and give it back to Claude, thanks. Thank you so much, Kedest. Yeah, I'm really proud to have you, you know, in this leadership position. It's, it's, it's really a good thing to have you there. Thank um, you. So our last speaker is Nizia Trindade. She is the head of the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation, known as Fiocruz. It's a 120 years old research institution with more than 10,000 working people. Nizia, the world is facing unprecedented changes due to the coronavirus pandemic, and you are the first woman leading this centenary health research institute. How do you see the role of women scientists at Fiocruz in addressing the pressing needs for, of the COVID-19 pandemic? Okay, uh, thanks, Claude. It's a pleasure, my pleasure to share this session with you, Claude, Claire, Moses, Kami, Kedes, it's very important for me to be here and share some ideas and some information about gender equity and in science. Well, uh, I think that pandemic challenges us to think deeply about gender equity. Women, uh, especially in Brazil. As Kedes, I think also, that this topic is not 
only a topic for women. It's a topic for women, men, for all societies. Gender equity is a essential topic for democratic agenda in all countries. Women are majority in Brazilian population and in higher education in the country, according to the Brazilian Institute of Geography and Statistics. However, career promotion bumps into the so-called gas saving, the invisible barrier that prevents more women from growing the profession and reaching higher positions. Uh, Kedes mentioned now the problem of the portfolio, and I think that you have to deal seriously about this question. In few clues, you have been working to change this movement, but we still have many challenges to overcome. As Claude mentioned, I was the first woman, woman to be president in 120 years of the institution. And today, women already make up more than 50% of our workforce. We also have around 51% of male leadership in research groups. Nevertheless, women still do not occupy most of the highest positions. In our deliberative council, for example, which is the highest body for formulating and conducting institutional development policy, women represent, represent only one third of the members. So we have a very hard work to do. In October 2019, Fiocruz launched the internal call More Girls at Fiocruz which aims to encourage and strengthen the fundamental role that women play in the areas of scientific and technological research. We are changing uh, for evaluating better the resumes uh, just to have uh, good results and better results in terms of gender equity in science. Specifically in terms of a uh, closed question, facing the current emergence, Fiocruz's commitment to be a strategic public institution for health and to strengthen the national surveillance system. Fiocruz is working on now front to respond to the pandemic, from diagnostic with the production of kits and analysis to research clinical trials for medicines and vaccines, communication, education, and also uh, trying to develop the vaccine here and produce uh, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. It's a very important uh, work in our institution. As in the Zika health emergence, women emerged in the institution's actions to fight the pandemic. I would like to highlight the work carried out in the laboratory of respiratory virus and measles at the Oswaldo Cruz Institute, which is a reference in the country for diagnostics and also a WHO reference laboratory for COVID-19 in the Americas. Under the leadership of Marilda Siqueira, this laboratory developed a very important job of training other laboratories in the 27 Brazilian states and Latin America. It is also worth mention the work of Valdilev, also director of our National Institute of Infectious Diseases, Evandro Chagas which already feels to its reference unity in the area, area of clinical research and specialized care in infectious disease. We have also built a hospital center for the COVID-19 pandemic, and it's a very important institutional initiative. At the same field of clinical research, since uh, Zika epidemic, I would, like, I would like also to mention Patricia Brazil, important role, and uh, besides her, many other researchers who face with Zika pandemic. 
I would also like to mention Priscilla Soares, Deputy Director of Management and Marketing, and Rosane Kuber Guimarães, Director of Quality of Biomanguinhos, our Institute of Technology and Immunobiologicals, where we have the production area for diagnostic kits and for vaccines. It's important to mention that women is in the leadership of all these initiatives. The same happens with education. Our Vice President, Cristiane Machado, has also worked tireless in the development of Fiocruz strategies to face the pandemic in the field of education. And education is a very important problem in terms of how to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. We have provided pedagogical support, not only for teachers to adapt activities, but also for students with a digital inclusion plan. We know how unequal Brazil is and these inequalities are expressed in the education. The same we are dealing with the, our school of technical, health, health techniques, uh, with the leadership of Anna Kayla Stock. It's also important to highlight the work in other centers of Fiocruz in the, all the re Brazilian regions. So I have to mention the work of Zélia Profetor, direct, director of Fiocruz in Minas Gerais, Marilda Gonçalves, director of Fiocruz in Bahia, and Fabiana Damasio, director of Fiocruz in Brasilia, who have been mobilized in this joint and integrated effort of all of your institutes and the units present in 11 states. They are also deal with the vulnerable people, one of the acts of Brazilian uh, Fiocruz intervention. Last, but definitely not least, I'd like to mention the work of Elise Andris and Pamela Langs in the Fiocruz Social Communication Coordination. Today, we have a network coordinated by the President's Social Communication Team, which has a fundamental role in addition to Fiocruz on vehicles. We are concerned with reaching everyone an interesting initiative in this regard is to watch out for Corona, a health communication campaign by Fiocruz together with social organizations of Brazilian favelas to uh, and the most vulnerable communities that surround the Fiocruz campus in Rio de Janeiro. Our materials are assembled based on residents' questions collected by partner community organizations. So research, vaccine, diagnosis, assistance, and also the work of uh, vulnerable people, not for them, but with them. And we have a very important initiative led by Claude Pirmez. I have to mention you, Claude, the initiative in Innova Fiocruz, a very important program for induced to, uh, with calls our researchers to think about innovation and the specific activities dedicated to COVID-19. All of these initiatives became viable due to our role as a science, technology, and health institute linked to the Ministry of Health. But we have many other partnerships. And I, I would like to mention the important partnership in global, in the great initiative Grand Challenges. All this is possible with the work of these remarkable women scientists. I'd like to thank all these teams, all the women scientists in our institution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nidia, so much for your words and, you know, telling uh, us about all these women working at Fiocruz 
and facing the COVID-19 uh, nowadays, in these uh, days. So I'll pass to <clears throat> Carly. I think we have some Q&A, uh, some questions from the audience, and she's going to lead this. Thank you very much, Claude. And uh, thank you to all the panelists who shared your uh, your insights um, and hopefully gave a perspective to the audience about how um, the Grand Challenges is enabling um, uh, women and uh, gender diverse um, thoughts uh, to be infused in the work that we're doing. Um, I would love to put um, uh, some of my fellow panelists on the spot. I'm going to actually go to Nisia first um, and just ask her to very briefly tell us about um, uh, what, you know, how, how does it feel to be leading a large institution in the way that you are? Um, and more specifically, what about um, you being a woman? What do you bring unique um, to that position? Um, so, Misia, can you come back on and, and address that question? Thanks, Carly. So, very important question. Uh, as a woman in Brazil and a, a woman, a social scientist, the first social scientist also at Fiocruz, I have to deal with many prejudices, of course. Uh, and I, I think that my field uh, today is a feeling of a commitment, commitment of our community. And I feel that I have a role to face with these inequalities and specifically about gender inequality. So uh, it's a very great challenge, but I'm not alone. We have uh, uh, many scientists, women and men, think about a democratic agenda, so important for science. So I'm, I'm courageous to face all these challenges because I'm not alone and I have the comprehension of so important is gender equity in science. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nisia, wonderful answer. Um, we did get one question in from uh, one of the audience members. I'll just read it here. And I'd love to have um, Moses and uh, maybe Claude in your position as well. Um, uh, as leading a funding organization to give a thought on this. Um, so I am a woman from the most remotest part of an India, tri India tribal dominated area. I heard about Grand Challenges opportunities. How as an independent woman can I submit application, an application to access resources for implementation of my idea or creative thinking. So it's really getting both to how does she go about doing it, but also I think some of the um, questions about resources to even get to the point of um, formulating that idea and putting into the application. So um, Moses, Claude, um, any ideas on this and anyone else who wants to answer? So I, I don't know if Moses is there, but um, as Kadesh said, uh, anybody anybody can apply. So it's a blind review. And this is the great thing about this. And this is a, a very um, important lesson we had here in Brazil is to see that this blind review really um, gives the opportunity for young women uh, young people, uh, you know, not not being a big, big scientist and a leader of it, it's just just have a good idea and apply it, and you have the chance, and the chance is there. And so we we had we we, we saw this in Brazil with our application, and it's it's really great to see that it's the, we have great stories on that. So do apply. Absolutely. So I, I, I also agree with uh, Claudia there that uh, um, the application process is usually very simple. Um, and uh, normally within Grand Challenges Africa, we usually do not mark the English uh, or French or, you know, uh, how, how excellent or how good you are in, uh, you know, your, your uh, grammar. We usually go for the idea. So the question is, uh, is your idea 
actually solving some of the pressing problems that we have within the globe at the moment. And uh, we know that, and I mean, all of you know that uh, at the moment, uh, if there's any group you can never compete with, uh, it is the cloud group, uh, everyone else, so to speak, um, even, even in social media contests. Uh, so, so, so what I'm saying is that uh, there are people out there with some really brilliant ideas. We would like to hear from you especially because we know that uh, um, uh, you know, the uh, lowest representation in STEM is actually in uh, low-income countries. Uh, so if you're out there and you have an idea and you think that you, 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 um, it can solve some of the issues that we have, when you see um, a challenge out there uh, for grand challenges, uh, please apply. We will be very glad to consider that particular idea. Thank you, Kanye. Thank you, Moses, and thank you, Claude. So really the answer is um, just put your words to paper. Um, there are resources available online to be uh, looking at how to write those proposals and how even to think through your idea so that they are well received. Um, and you, some of the competitions, you would get feedback um, on your idea as well, which could help you in future. So apply and don't give up um, would be uh, my answer to that as well. So we have wound up, we are run out of time. Um, we had lots more we could say, um, but Claude, maybe I'll pass it to you for the last uh, final words here. Okay, thank you all for being here with us, participation and participating in this session and this very insightful conversation. We really hope that this session uh, can, could help the changing the perception of perceptions, social norms and stereotypes to promote the empowerment of all women and girls, giving women equal opportunities for leadership at all levels of decision-making. So thank you very much to you all.